Um, I mean, uh, the pandemic is heading in the wrong direction at the moment. Um, but I will end this, you know, my intervention by saying we have tools that can turn it around. We are seeing cases and deaths increase again for the fourth week in a row. Um, more than 3.3 million new cases reported to WHO and just over, just under uh, 50,000 new deaths reported in the last seven days alone. This is the fourth week of increasing cases. Um, it's the fourth week of increasing deaths. Um, the global situation, you know, by region, of course, is, is variable. Um, out of those 3.3 million cases reported in the last week, uh, more than 2.1 million were reported in Europe alone. Wow. It's an 8% increase over the last week. Um, more than half of the deaths in the last week reported in Europe alone. Uh, a 5% increase in deaths in Europe in the last seven days. In the Americas, uh, another 8% increase, although they are seeing a slight decrease in deaths. In the Western Pacific, a 6% increase in deaths over the last week. Um, Africa, we've seen a sharp decline um, in cases over the last week. But we know reporting and testing around the world um, is spotty. Uh, we don't have strong uh, surveillance systems in all countries. We do have a lack of testing happening in a lot of countries as well. Um, you know, if I can say anything that we do see that is positive is that we still see quite a strong signal in the data that people who are vaccinated um, uh, are uh, far less likely to be hospitalized and far less likely to die. Um, and that is holding up in all of the data that we are seeing in countries. But of course, vaccination has to reach those who are most at risk in all countries. And what we're seeing um, is that um, those deaths that are happening um, from the countries where we have data, it's, it's largely happening among those who are unvaccinated. Um, and this is really critical because it's a tool that is um, widely available, not in all countries, however. Um, so we are concerned about what we are seeing across Europe. Um, there are different situations across Europe, and of course there are many countries across the European region, um, from the west to the east. Um, and there are countries that have high vaccination coverage um, and are seeing a significant decline um, in, in deaths. We do see other countries that high vaccines, high, high uh, access to vaccines, but low vaccination coverage. Um, and those countries are, again, seeing a lot of transmission that is happening, surges in transmission, as well as increases in deaths. Um, and we're getting reports uh, in many countries, far too many countries right now, that health systems are overburdened. Um, that health workers are overburdened, that hospital beds are filling up, that ICU is filling up. So, you know, you ask where we're going with this pandemic, the pandemic is far from over. Um, and you've heard us say that. Um, so there's a lot more work to be done um, to be able to get transmission down, as well as to save people's lives right now. And a lot of this starts with vaccination. Um, it's our best tool that we have right now, but it's not the only one. So we have to keep fighting for increasing vaccination coverage as well as driving transmission down at the same time. Thank you, Maria. And Mike, maybe you, we can hear from you and your reflections on the current situation. No, I think Maria said it very well and, and very succinctly. Um, and uh, uh, to an extent, we would need, really need to do is uh, protect the health systems from this <clears throat> being overwhelmed again. Uh, but also to recognize that the people who end up in those situations with severe disease, the people who end up in those situ situations of mental illness are in the main people with underlying conditions, older persons and others. And we saw that last year. <clears throat> we saw that last winter. Uh, and the best way to, for those individuals to be protected is to get vaccinated. And it's one tragedy to not have access to a vaccine <clears throat> and <clears throat> not being able to vaccinate yourself or a loved one who may be at risk. Uh, it's a totally other situation when the vaccines are widely available and, and people for whatever reason um, don't wish to take those vaccines and vaccine hesitancy uh, has become a major issue and it's so much based on trust. And we see that uh, happening for different reasons. Sometimes it's a lack of trust in general <clears throat> in government messages. Sometimes it's a lack of trust in science. Um, sometimes it's because of misinformation. And there are genuine situations where people are hesitant uh, to have vaccination because they don't feel they have the right information. 
and we need to and governments and, and, and public health authorities need to continue their efforts to dialogue and to give information, good information to people. And it's also people's responsibility to engage with that information and try and make the best decision they can for themselves and their families. Inform yourselves, learn, and get the knowledge, and then hopefully, on the basis of that knowledge, get vaccinated. But there's also misinformation out there. Uh, and that's the sad thing. It's difficult enough in a situation like this to make complex decisions around your health or the health of your loved ones. It's all the more difficult to make that decision when your choice is being actively interfered with by misinformation. Uh, and that can be deadly. Uh, so please, uh, for everyone out there, you have a right to knowledge, you have a right to information regarding vaccination and its benefits and its risks, and you have a right to make an informed choice. But please be informed by good information. Please uh, don't be affected by people who are putting up misinformation, which is directly aimed at, uh, at thwarting people's ability to, to make a good decision. Thank you so much, Mike. <clears throat> this is a, a great reminder. And I, maybe I, I will use the chance just to remind uh, our viewers that we also have some um, materials on our website and our social media channels on how to spot misinformation um, and how to help others to, to, to spot misinformation, but also how to report when they come across misinformation. So uh, you can check that on our website and social media channels. Um, Maria... Could I maybe just oh. also add to that, that it's also now for governments a responsibility to also look... Oh. Some people aren't being vaccinated <coughs> uh, because they're just... They're, they live in a situation, if I'm an unregistered, undocumented migrant, if I'm an older person living in a very remote area, if there's all kinds of reasons why I may not be vaccinated. Some of that may be hesitancy, but some of that may be because we need to create a better focus on identifying who is unvaccinated in our communities and then finding out why are they unvaccinated. In many cases, they're unvaccinated for logistics reasons, access reasons, uh, if an older person can't make it all the way to a vaccination site, we need to bring the vaccination to them. Same thing in marginalized communities who may not trust going into government centers, may not trust engaging with the state, and may be much more likely to accept vaccination if it's brought to them in pop-up clinics, in their own environment, in their communities where they feel safe. So governments also have to make an effort and redouble their efforts right now, not to give up, not to say, well, people are hesitant, nothing we can do. There is always a way. There is always a way to, to, to bring good information to people. There's always a way to improve vaccination coverage uh, and to engage with people who are genuinely hesitant. And there's always a way to fight misinformation. So I think each and each country is facing a different pattern. Not every country is facing the same pattern of uh, hesitancy or the same pattern of missed individuals. So um, I, I think right now, if, we were focusing on anything. It's making sure that those individuals at high risk who remain unvaccinated, we should be doing everything possible to offer them vaccine and everything possible to engage with them on any concerns they have regarding the vaccine. It's really, really important that we do that um, and, and, and try the least coercive means possible to engage with people and have them uh, take on the vaccine. Thank you so much, Mike. And uh, Maria, here is a follow-up question on the um, EPI situation, more on how we collect data from Jumun Kaushik, watching us on Facebook. How do you at WHO count positive cases? Do you need to do a PCR test to count, count it as positive? This is a great question. Um, so there are lots of different tests that are out there for um, identifying who is infected with SARS-CoV-2. Um, a lot of countries are relying on PCR-based uh, testing. That has greatly expanded in the last 20 to 23 months, um, much to the efforts of many different governments. And so the cases that we do receive are on these, on these PCR-based testing. There's also antigen-based testing that is out there. So these are rapid, reliable um, tests uh, that can be done outside of medical facilities, by trained individuals, of course, but in more communities. Um, and we've been working with countries to rapidly expand the use of antigen-based tests. One, because there are many reliable ones on the market. Um, they're easy, easier to use. They can be used outside of labs and outside of medical facilities by trained individuals, and they give a result back faster. 
Um, many of these antigen-based tests can give you a result back within 15 minutes or so. And this is important so the patient knows what to do. Um, testing for testing's sake alone is not enough. Testing needs to be linked to public health action. Um, so we rely on, on different ways to get information from countries. Ideally, what we would like um, from countries is information on hospitalization rates. You know, how many of the cases that are being detected are requiring needing hospitalization? This is important because, as Mike said, many of the systems are uh, coming overburdened again. The health systems are becoming overwhelmed. We would also love to be able to report on ICU capacity, again, having a better understanding of uh, the burden on the healthcare system and, and knowing what supplies are necessary. Um, because you know we rely on our health workers and our health systems to care for those not only with COVID-19 but other diseases other people need care and, and health facilities and if that bed is taken up by somebody with COVID then that bed can't be used you know for other for other reasons um, and ideally uh, if we could understand how many of the cases and deaths are amongst vaccinated or unvaccinated that would also help us track the system uh, the situation much better because as I mentioned previously, we are seeing a strong decoupling, we call it, you know, where we're looking at cases and deaths. And if you look at some of the increases, the epi curves, you know, the number of cases that are being reported each week by countries, if you look at the proportion of those individuals who are dying in countries that have high vaccination rates, we are seeing a strong reduction in deaths. And this is what you expect. You expect to see this, um, that you will have um, a massive reduction in hospitalizations and deaths. And this is why we have been working um, you know, so hard and with partners and with through the COVAX initiative and with many of our partners to ensure that countries have access to the vaccine. And as Mike said, making sure that the vaccines reach those who are most at risk. Vaccination is very different. Um, and also, as Mike mentioned, you know, what's critically important is not just who you vaccinate, it's who you miss. Um, and we need to be focusing on who we, who we are missing in those high risk categories. Um, so there's a lot of different types of data that we rely on. Um, we do rely heavily on respiratory disease surveillance, SARS-CoV-2 surveillance, which needs to be further enhanced. And as we enter the winter months in the Northern Hemisphere, one of the big concerns we have, especially as societies are opening up, um, in many countries are abandoning the public health and social measures. Some countries are putting those back in place now. We will see a resurgence of influenza. We will see a resurgence of other respiratory pathogens that circulate RSV, for example. Um, and this will confuse the situation because on, on the surface, um, you know, it's very difficult to distinguish between influenza uh, and uh, COVID. There's also the influenza vaccine. So if it's your opportunity to get the influenza vaccine, please get that because it will protect you against influenza. Um, and so we really need a good integrated surveillance system so that testing not only looks for SARS-CoV-2, it also looks for influenza, it looks for other respiratory pathogens. There's a lot of work to be done, um, especially as we go into the winter months. And maybe I could just add, because I think it's important to recognize and thank um, our member states, all the countries in the world who send us data on, on a daily basis and, uh, and uh, the laboratories around the world who share similar uh, data and not only on COVID, uh, on the SARS-CoV-2, but also on influenza, on RSV and others. And there's a, you know, a huge collaboration in trying to share data on cases, on deaths, on hospitalizations, so many other things, genetic sequences, um, on serologic uh, results and seroprevalence. And it's that patchwork of data that allows us to make a, a global assessment of what's going on. But that's not valid. WHO doesn't have labs in countries. We don't have systems in countries. That's, that's you, our, our, our member states, and people who work right the way through the health system and public health system in countries. And we end up with these wonderful tables every day, to, uh, and, uh, country by country by country. And that doesn't happen by accident. It takes a tremendous effort to pull all of that together. And again, to our WHO staff working at all three levels in our country offices, in our regional offices, and here in Geneva. They're an amazing group, and you don't see them in press conferences. You don't see these people in Facebook lives, but I can guarantee you they're up all night long. So by the time we get in in the morning, we have a full uh, analytics of the world situation today, not just in general, by country, by country, region, by region. 
every single morning and uh, it's like the elves and the shoemakers in terms of these uh, the unsung heroes and that and that's reproduced in every single country yeah. and we, we might not like the data we're looking at uh, and maybe it gives us uh, heart attacks and sometimes we get depressed looking at the numbers and then sometimes we see a shift in the positive and we all get very excited but uh, the fact that we have these numbers and the fact that countries spend uh, time sending us these numbers um, is, is hugely beneficial globally and it's a real sign again like with vaccine development that we can do things together we can share data and we can share responsibility for, 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 for responding to this pandemic. So I've never had a chance, uh, Alex, to give a shout out to, to those uh, people who work on surveillance and who work on data, work in the labs, because each and every time someone does a test and makes a positive result in a lab, each and every time someone does contact tracing, each and every time someone does a, a survey for seroprevalence and shares that data, not only is that data useful locally, but that data is useful nationally and it's critical critical globally. So um, thank you to all of you out there who, who work so hard. So at least as we fight this disease, we have very clear sight of the enemy. Thank you, Mike. We have a lot of uh, follow-up questions. And one is about trust and right to be informed. Um, mm. how, one, one of our LinkedIn viewers is asking, how can we have the right to be informed Oh, sorry, right to have informed choice when the government imposed the vaccination. So maybe we can comment. There were also some other viewers asking about mandatory vaccination when it comes to COVID-19. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult area in terms of uh, dealing with this because uh, there, are no, there are no straight answers uh, when it comes uh, to dealing with the issue of mandatory um, vaccination. Uh, our position in WHO is that mandatory vaccination should only be considered when um, the, the health gain that you're going to get from imposing that is very, very clear and that you've tried all other measures in order to, uh, to get people vaccinated. Um, um, I still personally believe that the best way is to continue engaging with people and to continue to drive that idea of an informed choice. Um, but there are circumstances in which the threat to society, the threat to the health system, um, the threat to the economy is such that governments, having tried all other measures, feel under their national public health law, and again, this is something that can only be implemented under national sovereign countries implementing under the law with due respect for human rights, due respect for liberty, are able to make that decision. And that's, that's not an easy decision, and that's a decision that a government may be forced to make or feel that it's forced to make. Uh, but it, in, in our view, that should not be attempted before all other means of, of um, offering vaccine and informing people about vaccination and decreasing vaccine hesitancy. These should be the primary means by which we get vaccination coverage up. Um, but some governments uh, feel that having uh, attempted that uh, and having tried, uh, at least in their minds, their best to be able to address that, uh, are um, uh, looking to uh, using mandatory vaccination, either mandatory vaccination for work or mandatory vaccination or proof of uh, previous infection to access hotels, restaurants, uh, and even to the extreme of asking people who are unvaccinated to stay home as opposed to vaccinated people being out. And this raises real issues around civil liberties. This raises real issues uh, around uh, human rights. Uh, and it's something that governments should consider extremely carefully. I mean, extremely carefully. Uh, and they need to be absolutely sure that the benefit of doing this uh, outweighs the risks and that they have done everything possible to address vaccine hesitancy and other issues, and they, they feel that they have no other alternative. Um, if these uh, types of mandates are implemented, they need to be implemented for the shortest possible period. Um, and uh, as, as I said, they need to be consistent with national public health and human rights law. Uh, and therefore, that is... It has to be a decision of a sovereign government to do that. 
and it needs the decision needs to be taken extremely carefully um, and uh, and implemented very very uh, as 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 sensitively as possible but again to reiterate who's position in general is that mandatory vaccination is not the best means to achieve the highest vaccine uptake um, and uh, but there are as i said specific circumstances and we've had that historically hepatitis b vaccination for health workers um, and it has to have an objective of protecting uh, that individual or protecting society or protecting the health system there must be very clear um, reasons demonst demonstrated stated reasons why that action is being taken uh, and there needs to be a dialogue in a, in a, within government and within agencies and with communities around these issues. So I, I'm sorry to go around the long way on this because there are no, it's a really good question uh, and it's a complex question for which the answers are equally complex. Thank you, Mike. And here's one more question regarding vaccination and um, coming as a follow-up to what you were saying earlier from Angel Torcielo. I hope I pronounced this well. What do you do if you can't get the vaccine? Stay away from people and hugs forever. What other therapies do we have? I want to spend time with my family for holidays. Who was that question from? The question is coming from Angel Torcielo. Okay. No, I just wanted to use Angel's name because I, I, I feel for you. That's mm -hmm. uh, a situation that many, many people find themselves in. It's one thing to have a discussion around people having access to vaccine and not wanting it. But the, the more tragic situation is clearly people who don't have access to vaccine uh, and are still trying to protect themselves. And that's, is, that story is repeated millions of times around the world. And the reason it's being repeated that way is, is, is because of inequity. Um, it, is, it is still possible for individuals to be able to protect themselves and reduce their risk, but there's no zero risk. And I fully understand that people want, need to get back to economic life, go to school. Um, I think uh, the level at which you protect yourself or have to protect yourself should very much be determined by your risk of having severe disease. So um, certainly if Angle or other individuals are in the older age group um, or have uh, underlying conditions, then if you don't have access to vaccine, then it's extremely important that you're able to shield yourself from infection because infection does have serious consequence for someone in your situation. Um, so the, the, that's an important uh, thing to consider. Uh, there are, I mean, clearly someone who, even people who are very unwell with proper hospital care, and we've all had family members who've been ill and have done well in a hospital situation with oxygen, uh, with dexamethasone uh, and increasingly monoclonal antibodies, but not everyone has access to them either. And very often where people don't have access to vaccine, they don't necessarily have va access to those therapies. Uh, we do have some hope for the future with the new drugs uh, potentially coming online that can be used to treat people early in the course of disease. <clears throat> but they're, they're a good bit down the road. Um, and uh, they're not immediate. Uh, they're not immediate solutions. And to be honest with you, if I was in a situation where I have the choice of having a vaccine to protect myself for the long term, or waiting to get infected and hoping I can get a therapy, I'll take the vaccine. But in Angle's case, it's there's no vaccine available. So um, that's that's a uh, that's a, a difficult one to answer because in the absence of vaccine. Uh, that avoiding infection is your best policy. But right now, avoiding infection is becoming more and more difficult as everyone's going back to school. You're expected to go back to work in, in many countries with or without vaccination, especially countries who haven't got access to vaccine. So um, I don't know, Marie, if you want to add anything there, but it's, uh, it's, it's a, the situation is not unique and, in fact, shockingly common. I don't know where Angel is, but I think, you know, the other reason why when it is your turn to get vaccinated is to not only protect yourself, but to protect others, you know, so vaccines, the primary function of the vaccine is for, to prevent against severe disease and death. They don't completely prevent against infection or transmission, but they do are really, they're, they're showing that they have some efficacy for that as well. So when you are offered the vaccine, you're helping yourself, but you're also helping others. 
Um, and so if Anhel's in a situation where there are any vaccines and, and people that he comes in contact with can be vaccinated, they need to be vaccinated. So maybe he has a medical reason um, to not be able to get vaccinated, but that's why we need everyone when it's your turn to get vaccinated. And I do want to highlight that for the first year of this pandemic, we didn't have vaccines. And there were a lot of tools, the same tools that we have now, the distancing, the, the mask wearing, the uh, avoiding crowded spaces, improving ventilation where we live and we work and we study, um, you know, that really brought transmission down. Um, and that protects others. That reduces your exposure to other people. Um, the Delta variant, which is, you know, more transmissible than the ancestral strain, the first virus that was circulating, um, makes it harder. So that's why we need vaccines and these other tools as well. Um, but I feel for him, I feel for the, the question because, you know, he, you will be able to hug people again, you know, and see your loved ones again. Um, we're still very much in the thick of this, but this pandemic will end. And I think people need to understand out there that, that pandemics do end. Unfortunately, I don't think we're close to that yet, but every day that we work, you know, towards reducing our risk, every day we work towards increasing vaccination coverage around the world gets us closer to the end of that pandemic. So don't lose hope. Um, I, I hope you find some comfort in our, in our response, but um, I think there are a lot of people that are in situations like that. So when those of you who are out there do what you can, you know, to protect those who don't have access to the vaccine, who don't, who cannot receive the vaccine for whatever reason. I know we are running out of time, but we have a few more questions, so maybe we try to answer them short. Um, Twitter viewer is asking any comments on countries that are scaling down test, trace, and isolation measures. Uh, short answer, please don't. Uh, right now, what we need is more emphasis on this because it's not only important for the current situation. Having these systems in place for strong surveillance, strong testing, early clinical care, supporting our workforce will help now and it will help in the future. So our advice is to scale up everywhere, no matter if transmission is going up, transmission is going down, scale up. Thank you, Maria. And another question from you from Juliana Benz. Um, what news is there on US variants and will vaccine manufacturers be able to keep up? So, uh, you know, the virus is still evolving, as you hear us say often. Um, the Delta variant, um, which is the latest variant of concern, um, is dominant worldwide. In fact, in the last 60 days alone, um, you know, around 800, 900,000 sequences have been shared um, globally and shared with platforms like GISAID, um, and more than 99% of those are the Delta variant. Um, Delta itself is evolving because, of course, it doesn't, uh, it, this is what viruses do. Um, so there may be more variants that you will hear uh, us talk about. Um, there are other variants of concern, alpha, beta, gamma, but those are largely, you know, significantly reduced. Delta is really the dominant one. And there are two variants of interest, mu and lambda, um, that we've been tracking as well. But again, Delta, where Delta is present, Delta takes over. Um, so it's important that um, you know we keep tracking this and we have a whole global system out there in terms of surveillance and testing and sequencing, sharing of those sequences, uh, detailed analysis and discussion about each of the mutations, each of the variants, and then of course what this means for our countermeasures. The vaccines that are in use are currently incredibly effective, even against the Delta variant, um, protective against severe disease and death. So getting a vaccine uh, will save your life. So please, you know, get vaccine, get vaccinated. Your chances of, of severe disease and um, death are significantly reduced when you get that vaccine. Thank you, Maria. Mike, maybe you can take this one. Um, one of the viewers is asking if you can explain whether the virus will mutate if it enters the body <coughs> of a person who is already vaccinated as its own defense mechanism kicks in and its own need to spread takes precedence. Yeah, it, it, it's a good question, and um, uh, certainly you, you hear about um, resistance or, um, to antibiotics and, and other things, and because uh, organisms can evolve resistance, and that's what we're, we're, we're talking about in terms of mutation. The, um, the, the issue with uh, vaccines uh, being, when you have a vaccine, you, you're not infected usually, right? And then you're in, 
the bug comes along and it's a numbers game in the end right because at that stage you have very low numbers of viruses coming in compared to the your capacity to respond when you use an antibiotic very often or an antiviral there's already billions of viruses in the body and then you're using uh, uh, um, uh, a, a drug against them so basically it's a game of numbers when there are so many viruses around the chances that one uh, could be able to resist the treatment is quite high whereas on the other hand the fact that you are vaccinated in advance of being infected it becomes a numbers game and your your immune response can overwhelm the invaders mo very very quickly um, uh, the, the, the second uh, uh, a thing is that uh, when we see mutations or um, in in terms of drug resistance or uh, in terms of uh, um, the way in which the body uh, will react to uh, to uh, to a, a, a bug arriving uh, when you we talk about many of our therapies the, the antibiotics and in this case antivirals very often they're small molecules and all you need is a very small change in the um, in the virus for resistance to emerge whereas with vaccines in general you don't see that because very often the the, the target that the, the amount of mutation that the virus has to do to escape the vaccine uh, or the effects of the vaccine is an awful lot so it's, it's just a matter of the scale of mutations required we do see for example in influenza it's a virus that mutates very very rapidly and over a season or two seasons you see that the virus sort of uh, evades the vaccines because the virus mutates beyond the capacity of the vaccine to protect because it's a very immutable virus and it can happen but uh, in the main I would say that we're not that as concerned about uh, mutations arising because of vaccination as we would be by uh, mutations arising uh, be because of uh, anti antivirals could help drive uh, the uh, the uh, evolution of the virus and something we have to be very careful with I don't think Maria we're seeing any evidence thus far um, of <clears throat> the virus evolving because of vaccination but it is evolving and it could evolve beyond the capacity of the vaccine to protect but we're not seeing any evidence whatsoever that being vaccinated in fact being vaccinated is giving your best chance and it's giving us our best chance of avoiding dangerous mutations in the virus thank you so much mike um we know you need to go maybe maria you can take the the last question because we were talking in last time and i think few times about covid 19 becoming an, an uh, endemic. Mm -hmm. So one of our viewers is asking how do we push back on our local government leaders that insist we have reached the endemic phase of COVID-19? It's an it's a interesting question. I mean, you know, we've been having a lot of discussions internally about what's the future of COVID-19 and we're thinking of this in terms of scenarios of what may happen. Um, I, can, I can assure you that we're very much in the pandemic and a pandemic means pan, you know, it's, it's across the world. The virus itself is, you know, is moving towards becoming endemic, but that doesn't mean that it's transmitting at the same level of intensity that we see right now, killing as many people as we see it killing, taking the livelihoods of so many people that we see it taking their livelihoods. Um, and so the, the pathogen, the virus itself is on its way, but we're not there yet. Um, you know, this virus is affecting all regions of the world, all countries of the world. It is killing far too many people right now. It is an extremely dangerous virus. And you all know that because you're living through this. Um, but it, you know, it, it may become, it will become endemic. When that is, it depends on us. Um, and it, the, the pandemic is still raging. Uh, and so what we are working towards with all governments is applying this comprehensive approach you know, really taking stock and assessing the situation where where they live, where you live, where you operate. What is the local epi situation? Not just cases and deaths, but also the burden on the healthcare system. And what is your capacity to respond and adjust? You know, adjust what is needed at the intensity that it is needed to really, you know, drive the deaths down and also drive transmission down as much as possible. Um, so I think, you know, we need to be very clear of where we are in this pandemic. Um, but be very clear that there's a lot that we can do to get, this, get us closer to the end. Thank you so much, Maria. Thank you, Mike. Um, and we thank all viewers for very interesting questions. Uh, we hope we'll have more time next time to take more of these. So thank you everyone for watching us and please for more information or questions, follow our social media channels or website.
goodbye.